Good morning. Uh, my name is Alistair Chapman, and today we're going to be looking at this camera here from Sony, the FR7. So I'm at uh, Visual Impact in Teddington, and Visual Impact are both a supplier of professional broadcast television equipment and also a rental house. So don't forget if you have any rental requirements or purchase requirements, do give them a shout. And I will say that something that for me, for my career really, has been very important is having that relationship with a dealer. Because these days there's a big temptation to buy stuff online. You just go onto a website, find the lowest price and click buy and it gets delivered the next day and everything is great until something maybe goes wrong or you need a bit of help or advice with that piece of equipment and then you don't know who to call. Um, so my suggestion, my recommendation is to build a relationship with the dealer of your choice so that you can make that call. You know who to call, you know what to do if something goes wrong with your gear. Um, and I've had a relationship with Visual Impact that goes back for probably 30 years now. And uh, it's been really good over the years having that uh, 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 understanding. So I know who to talk to when I need some help. So coming back to this, the Sony FR7 from Sony. So um, the this device is a um, pan and tilt, wrong camera, pan and tilt um, unit that can be controlled remotely uh, using a joystick, tablet, or a computer. And it actually shares a lot of commonality with the Sony um, uh, FX6 camera. So it's Netflix approved, which is one of the great things about it. So you can use the FR7 for Netflix productions, perhaps to put a camera somewhere that may be inaccessible with a normal camera. Um, and because it has that same or very similar color science to the Sony Venice camera, the FX6, FX9, et cetera, it will cut in with your footage and all your existing material really, really easily. And at the moment, it, it certainly was the world's first pan, and, pan, tilt, and zoom camera that combines um, lens interchangeability with a full-frame image sensor. Um, and that makes the way the images from this look uh, very, very different to most other PTZ cameras. It has that filmic style quality to the images that you get with a larger sensor and with higher quality uh, zoom lenses. Um, and as I say, it is part of the Sony Cinema line. So it has that very similar look. It has S Cinetone, the same as the FX3, FX6, FX9, et cetera, as well as a Cine EI mode for log shooting with S Log3. So you can um, shoot using exactly the same ISOs and everything else as you would with an FX6. And a lot of the menu system on the FR7 is very similar to that of the FX6 because essentially it is an FX6 in this pan, tilt, and zoom housing. Now, one thing I didn't actually mention at the beginning was, of course, you can ask questions via the chat box at any point. So if you've got anything you want to know about the camera or anything in this uh, webinar or this session, do um, type away in that box and I'll try and answer as many questions as I can as we go along. Um, in terms of controlling the camera, well, you have a few different options. Um, it uses standard um, PTZ protocols. So you can use the Sony controller. This is the... Um, PTZ uh, uh, sorry, RMIP 500, um, you can use that. You can also control it via a tablet, such as an iPad here. So I have this running on an iPad. And you can also control it uh, from a PC. So because the, um, because the FR7 is connected to a network, to a router. There's a, a router just sitting behind the, the desk here. Um, any computer with a web browser can log into that router, and then you can control the camera through the web browser on the computer. And it's actually really quite easy to do. 
So one of the things that I did with the camera uh, a while back was I shot um, at a circus with the camera and it was a very low budget shoot and to control the camera I actually used my um, laptop uh, connected via Wi-Fi wi to the router and then using the web GUI on the laptop and you have a pan tilt and zoom control zoom and it's all there on the laptop and I'll show you that screen um, in a little bit and that worked really well and I was just sat in the back row of the audience controlling the camera we shot the circus performance four times four different angles and then we're able to cut that together to get really good coverage of the show and the the real beauty of the FR7 was the ability to place it up in the in the rigging high up in the top of the big top tent to get views that you wouldn't normally be able to get, uh, not without climbing equipment, certainly. Um, so you have lots of ways of controlling it and then the ability to put it in interesting and different places really opens up, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of creative um, possibilities. And we're seeing them used for concerts, for live events, um, just for perhaps corporate videos for streaming and things like that as well. So it has the same full frame, <coughs> excuse me, uh, full frame sensor as Sony's FX6 and FX3 cameras. So we have over 14 stops of dynamic range, or actually over 15 stops of dynamic range. We have the ability to shoot in 4K, 4K DCI, as well as UHD. <laughs> and all the image processing is done by Sony's Bions XR image processors that were designed to work with these sensors. Um, and this makes it very efficient. It doesn't require huge amounts of, of power. <coughs> Excuse me one moment, I'm just going to take a drink. It doesn't require huge amounts of power. And that allows you to actually power it then via... Uh, PPOE++, so you can power it over the Ethernet cable that feeds the camera, um, and that makes rigging it in remote places very, very easy. Um, so the ISO, like the FX6, goes up to 409,600. I'm not sure realistically how practical that really is, but it's a dual ISO camera. So in S-Log3, if you're shooting log with the camera, you have two ISOs of 800 and 12,800, and you get really good performance at both of those ISOs. Um, you have 15 plus stops of dynamic range, and that really does help you to um, you know, get a, a really good image in very challenging light. Um, a lot of other conventional PTZ cameras with smaller sensors really struggle in uh, very high dynamic range situations to deliver a really nice image. And because that dynamic range does match the FX3, FX6, and is very, very close to the Venice camera, it allows you to get a really good image in challenging light. And it can also go up to 120 frames per second. So we can shoot 120p in 4K for slow motion. And that gives you really nice sort of depending on frame rates, your base frame rates up to sort of four and a half, five times slowdown. And that really does allow you to shoot things a bit differently. And again, this was something I used when I shot the circus, was being able to shoot at 120 frames per second allowed me to get some really nice footage of things like the, the fire breathing acts and things like that. Um, so the SDI output, so it has a 10-bit um, uh, output over HDMI and SDI, and that goes up to 60p. So you can output 60p, 4K over HDMI or SDI, uh, depending on what you need. And you'll see on the back of the camera, we have an SDI socket and an HDMI socket. We're using the HDMI today for, for this, but they are both uh, there. There's also a time code in and time code out. Um, so a uh, time code in and a Genlock connector. So you can genlock the, the FR7 for multi-camera shoots uh, and things like that when you need to. Um, we have, as I said, S-Log3. We have the same S-Log3 with S-Gamut3 and S-Gamut3.cine as the rest of the Sony Cinema line. So in terms of grading and post-production, if you're shooting with log, the workflow is exactly the same. And today, though, we're not using log for this uh, session. We're using S-Cinetone. So the cameras that I'm using here. So the wide camera here is a, an FX6, 
And then the close-up camera is uh, an FX3. And then we have the output of the FR7 as well. And that's the same S Cinetone um, as the other cameras. Um, so, ah, right, I've just been pointed out that the FX6 camera overlays are switched on. Um, so um, bear with me one second and I will turn those off. Um, how embarrassing. Uh, I should know better than, uh, than that. Uh, so let's get rid of those um, so that you're not looking at all of those uh, overlays. Of course. All right. Sorry about that. Um, so you should now have a clean image. Uh, how embarrassing. I should know better. I am supposed to know these cameras and be an expert on them. And leaving the overlays on is a bit of a oops moment. Anyway, um, so I uh, hopefully didn't distract too much uh, from what's going on. But now all my secrets about how the camera set up are revealed. Um, anyway, so moving on. Um, what else can we do with the FR7? So we have um, a very fast pan and tilt speed. Now, one thing to note about the camera is it doesn't actually go full circle. So um, if, uh, let's bring up the close-up shot, there is a dead point at the back. So it gets to there and stops, and then we can go all the way around the other way, and it will stop there. So it is, uh, it does cover full um, 360 degrees, but there is, it, you can't go round and round and round. So that is one of the limitations with the camera. Um, and then we have a, a full 180 degree tilt, so it will tilt all the way. Um, uh, so it's upside down if you want. And of course that means you can mount the camera um, and hang it upside down. So it doesn't have to sit this way up. You can hang the camera um, from trusses and rigging and things like that without any issues. Um, it has Sony's fast hybrid autofocus, the same as the other cameras, and it also has touch to focus. So if you're using a tablet or a computer to um, control it, you can actually use touch to focus. So let's um, just see if we can take a look at that for a minute. So just bear with me a second as I come out of the PowerPoint slides on the laptop. And I'm going to bring up now the web interface. So this is the web interface on my laptop. And from here, I can now control the camera. So down here in the bottom corner, I have a, a virtual joystick, and I can move the camera um, quite easily. And then I can touch where I want to focus by moving my cursor onto the screen and just touching. And we have the same focus tracking as you'd have with any other camera. So if I move the camera now, it will track, track that. Or if that was a moving object within the shot, it would track. So we have the same tracking functions and the same touch to uh, focus function albeit via uh, the web interface or computer interface that you'd have with any other um, Sony camera. Um, and if we look at the output of the FR7, if I touch on the camera here, you'll see that we change and the focus goes to that point there and the same to there. So it's a very, very easy camera to use in that regard. And I really do like the way that the, um, the web interface uh, with the camera works. So I'm just going to come back to my PowerPoint slides. So make sure I don't forget anything that I wanted to talk about. Um, you have um, real-time IAF and tracking AF, the same as all the other Sony cameras. And if you, um, if you, if you know um, those Sony cameras, you'll know that the, the autofocus is really very, very good. And when I shot the circus, it was mostly using autofocus and just simply using the web application to touch where I wanted the camera to focus. And then the tracking would take care pretty much of everything else. 
It also has breathing compensation. So with the um, certain Sony lenses, you'll get breathing compensation. And that makes the autofocus changes uh, transparent. So as the focus changes, you don't see the size of the image um, breathe. And that makes the AF um, really easy to use. It also has Sony's electronic variable ND filter. And if you're shooting outside, this really is a godsend. If the light suddenly changes halfway through something you're shooting, being able to remotely introduce the variable ND filter really does make a big difference. With a lot of other pan, tilt, and zoom cameras, you either have a switchable ND filter that might only have one or two steps of ND, um, or you might not have any ND at all. But being able to remotely control the ND from a quarter to 128th ND makes it very, very easy to use this camera, um, especially in outside um, shoots, perhaps concerts and things like that, where the light might change dramatically throughout the day. The web app I've already shown you. So the web app does give you total control of the FR7. Um, and I really do think that whenever you are using the FR7, it's something that you want to have set up. So even if you're using the IP500 control panel, you probably want the web app running on a tablet or on a PC at the same time, just to give you access to the touch to focus. And it's by far the easiest way to access the menus in the camera. So you have basically a mirror of the menu system that you would have in an FX6 or uh, another Sony traditional camera via the web app. And it's really quick to change your settings and generally, I find if you want to change settings, it's much easier to do them via the web app compared to trying to do them via the IP500. <clears throat> the IP500, though, has the benefit of having that nice big joystick and a zoom rocker. So there is um, a zoom rocker here, and we can use that to zoom in and out. And there is a speed control uh, for the zoom there, for the overall maximum speed of the rocker. There is a wheel for focus if you're using manual focus, and that makes manually focusing very easy. And then, of course, we have the nice big uh, easy-to-use joystick um, that also has a twist knob at the end that you can use to control the zoom. So that gives you a great deal of very, uh, very good, um, smooth control directly. Um, and I think... If you are going to invest in an FR7 system um, and you don't have another suitable controller, then you probably do want to buy the IP500 if you're going to use this system a lot. If you're just an occasional user of the um, FR7, then the web app is possibly all you really need. Um, and if you run it on on a tablet, something like this, it does give you everything that you need to use the camera. So you can pan, tilt, zoom, um, and do everything from here. And actually, the, the pan and tilt is surprisingly easy, um, easy to control and has uh, a great deal of precision, even from this little uh, wheel here. And uh, I found that, you know, shooting circus I could do that. Now, one of the things, though, with this is <clears throat> there is a little bit more lag when you use the web app between the, um, the control of the pan, tilt, and zoom compared to when you use the joystick on the IP500. So the IP500 joystick is very responsive. Um, things happen very quickly. If you use the, the one on here, there's a little bit more lag, and that was... Certainly one of the challenges when I shot the circus was that um, the, the extra lag that this, uh, using the, the PC, um, had did make things a little bit more difficult if I was trying to follow some fast action. Um, but for concerts and things where perhaps you're not trying to follow something as fast moving as, say, a trapeze act in a circus, this would be perfectly suitable for controlling the camera. Now, a lot of people are buying the FR7 for wildlife applications, for um, shooting animals in their natural habitat without uh, perhaps somewhere where uh, a person being present would disturb that animal's behavior. 
um, and things like that. And again, where there isn't a great deal of very fast action, I think you'll find that the web app would be perfectly good enough to do everything that you want. And if I bring the web app back up on the computer for a minute, just bear with me a second. Um, you'll see that th controlling things like um, shutter speed and everything like that, uh, changing the record format and all of these things are very, very easy from the web app. So we go into this settings page where you can change um, things like your shooting settings, which includes autofocus, your project settings, uh, which is your record format, uh, what you're going to record on the internal cards. And um, of course, as well as outputting over the SDI and HDMI, there are two card slots in the camera unit itself. So you can record locally on the camera. And it has the same codecs um, as the um, FX6. So we have XAVC-I and XAVC-L. And we can shoot uh, HD, UHD, or 4K DCI. Um, you can have um, simultaneous record, recording to both cards, proxy recording. And we also have things like interval record, uh, picture cache record, which again on the circus was quite a handy thing to have because often things happen a little bit unexpected. Um, and then you can save all your settings as an all file, just the same as an FX6. Um, we have the paint settings. We can load in uh, different LUTs to create custom looks. So in the uh, custom mode, so when we're not shooting log, one of the things that you can do is you can load a LUT into the camera and then that LUT becomes the camera's look. Um, you can do the same thing with the FX6, um, FX3, all of the cinema line cameras. Actually, the FX9 doesn't do it. Um, and it allows you to create your own custom look uh, as a cube LUT, a 33 times cube LUT. You load that into the camera, and then you can have that custom look. Um, and you don't have to use the log shooting mode to do that. So you'll have the same gain settings as you'd have with a conventional camera. So you can increase the gain for lower light or decrease the gain. Um, and it works just like a conventional camera, just with your chosen look that you've created baked into the image. And it's a very useful function um, to have. Um, we can also uh, control um, pan and tilt speed range, um, acceleration as well, so how quickly it accelerates. Um, we can have limits uh, on the pan and tilt um, and zoom speed. And we can also create presets um, for our different pan and tilt settings. We have our monitoring settings. Again, this is very similar to the uh, FX6, et cetera. Audio settings, um, because there is uh, an audio input on the camera um, for recording external audio, um, and you can put external mics into the camera. And then the technical settings, we have things like the tally lamps, um, the IP remote settings, and also settings for an RCP and MSU. So that's a remote control panel. So as well as controlling the camera via the IP500 in terms of pan, tilt, zoom, and very basic paint settings, you can also control the camera with a, and paint the camera with an RCP. So in a studio or outside broadcast environment, it will integrate very well with that um, OB truck or that live environment and allow the um, camera to be painted remotely the same as most other cameras on that OB truck. Um, so it really integrates great great in a, a, an outside broadcast situation. And again, it's going to be things like concerts, music events, um, perhaps theatres and plays, performances and stuff like that, where I think the FR7 will find a very good place. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so moving down the menu, we have our network settings. And we can put in um, all our settings for the, the network that the camera is connected to, as well as um, FTP servers for streaming. So we can, um, for up, sorry, for upload, because you can upload proxies automatically to um, uh, an S FTP server. And then down here, we have the streaming settings, because one of the things that we can do uh, with the <clears throat> camera is to stream live. So we can use it on its own as a standalone streaming camera. 
And that might be useful for corporate events and conferences, things like that, where you want to remotely stream the content from the camera. And perhaps using a single camera streaming live, you could cover uh, a conference or something like, quite, like that quite effectively. And one of the good things about a pan, tilt, and zoom camera compared to actually having a camera, op <coughs> a camera operator is that this is very small, it's very compact, so you can have it right at the front of the stage or front of the house, um, and it doesn't obstruct the view of the audience. Um, again, with the circus performances that I filmed, it meant that I could put the camera right at the very front of the performance area, um, which with the circus is the floor, it's not a raised area. So it would get, allowed me to get a camera in positions that I wouldn't normally be able to, to do. I certainly couldn't put a camera on a tripod and operate it conventionally from the very edge of that performance area. Whereas something as small as this, I could just place on the floor at the front of the circus ring and get some really nice low shots looking up at the circus performers. So it, it allows, me, uh, allows you to get shots that you wouldn't otherwise uh, get. And then in our maintenance settings, the last part here, um, we have language settings, settings for the clock, um, and uh, various other things like this, where you do your firmware updates and things like that. We can also play back um, clips from the camera as well. And again, this is so much easier to do. Hello, Rob, um, guys sitting at the back of the room who are now um, much embarrassed because I've just put them live on air. Let's pan back around so they're not... Let's go the other way, actually. As you can see, we can pan very quickly with the camera. Um, they're going to get a shock in a moment because there's about a 10-second delay um, between what, what I'm doing here and them seeing it there. So they're sitting at the back of the room completely oblivious of what's going on, and suddenly now they're all going, oh, my God, I'm on the, on the web stream. Um, but that's all been and gone now, and that happened 20 seconds or so ago. Um, just checking to see if we've got any questions. Um, no questions so far. So um, you're either understanding everything, um, you know everything about this camera, uh, or simply um, I'm doing a good job with my presentation. So I'm just going to come back to the PowerPoint slides. And uh, I'll try not to bore you too much with PowerPoint. Um, you can have, one of the nice things about the FR7 uh, is it's very easy to set up preset camera positions. And you can do this in a variety of ways. You can do it from the IP500, you can do it with the web app, and that allows you to um, set uh, your presets and then the camera will move to and from those presets when you select each preset. And again, this is uh, for something like maybe corporate work or conferences, allows you to very quickly go from different shots and different camera positions really quickly. And it's very, very easy to do, um, he says. Uh, so let me jump back to the um, camera interface here. So here on the uh, left side of the screen, there is a, an area that's currently blank. So let me um, just move the camera so that the, um, this um, FX3 here is, is centered in the shot. Uh, and let's zoom in on it. And I could save that now as a preset. And you can see now we have a preset position saved with a little thumbnail of what that, that position is. And now if I pan around here perhaps, and we can maybe have a preset here on, on this uh, banner in, in the room, maybe we'll zoom out a little bit. And now I can click plus to add another preset. So I now have my two preset camera positions. And to move between them, I can just double click on this and the camera will move to that new preset position and uh, not sure why the focus is taking so long to change. Um, and then just by double clicking, we can go between these different camera positions. It's probably just a little bit too close to the camera actually, that's probably why it's struggling with um, with focus that is very close to the camera. So the lens that I've got on the camera right now is the 28 to 135 millimeter Sony lens. 
Um, and in terms of what lenses can you put on the camera, well, actually quite a wide range. But of course, most of the time you're going to want a power zoom. Um, so that does make your choices a little bit narrower. So almost any of the Sony power zooms can go on the FR7. Um, but Crozial also manufacture a kit specifically for the FR7 that allows you to motorize the zoom of a lens that doesn't have a motorized zoom. And that kit interfaces directly with the FR7. So it plugs into the back of the FR7 here so that the zoom is then controlled via the IP500 or the web app exactly as if it was a Sony power zoom. Now, there are some limitations depending on how perhaps how stiff that zoom lens is as to how quickly it will zoom and how smoothly it will zoom. But overall, the Crozial kit is very, very good. And in particular, um, I see a lot of uses if you're using Sony's 70 to 200 millimeter lens on the camera. So you'll still have the Sony autofocus and everything else. And then using the Crozial zoom kit to power and operate the zoom on that lens. And it allows you then to have longer focal lengths. In terms of focal lengths, this is perhaps one of the restrictions of the FS, FR7 compared to other <coughs> PTZ cameras, is that because you have this large sensor, your choice of zoom lenses is going to be more restricted. Um, the same thing applies really to the FX6, FX9, et cetera, that the zoom ranges that you get on full frame lenses tend to be much narrower, much shorter range than you have on a smaller sensor. So traditional PTZ cameras that maybe have a two third inch sensor or a much smaller sensor will tend to have a much greater zoom range. And as you go up to bigger and bigger sensors, the zoom range tends to become less and less and less. So that is the trade-off with the FR7 that you get, that you're, you have this very big sensor, and that does mean that you can't have such a large zoom range because big, big zoom ranges get very, very heavy. The lenses become very, very heavy. The 28 to 135mm f4 lens works really well on the FR7. That's what I use for the circus shoot. But in addition to the mechanical or the physical zoom, you do also have clear image zoom on the FR7, which gives you another 1.5 times zoom range in the 4K mode in UHD. So that takes the focal length of the 28 to 135 up to um, almost, uh, it's about 185 millimeters, something like that, or the equivalent of. And then if you're using Sony 70 to 200, that gives you almost the equivalent of 70 to 300 millimeters if you combine it with clear image zoom. So although the zoom ranges are a little bit smaller or smaller than you'd have with a traditional PTZ camera, the ability to use clear image zoom along with perhaps the Crozial kit or just with the 28 to 135 does allow you to actually get quite reasonably long shots from this camera. Um, um, but the big, big thing is the image quality. This is giving you that cinema style image quality, very, very high image quality. And so often these days we see a lot of um, shows like um, the blind date type shows and, and dating shows and things like that where they use PTZ cameras to film the blind date element uh, or the, uh, the big brother type elements of the, the show. And then the interviews and the more formal stuff is done with a full-size camera. And you can generally clearly see the difference in image quality between the main camera doing the interviews and things like that and the PTZ cameras. And it can be a bit of a distraction. But with the FR7, because there would be no difference in image quality between the using an FR7 and then perhaps an FX6 or FX9 to do your interviews and everything like that, it makes the show more coherent as all the footage would look the same. Um, and I think this is where you have to sort of trade, make that trade off between a little bit less in terms of zoom range, but a lot more in image quality. So just coming back to the uh, PowerPoint slides for a moment. So on the uh, front of the camera, there are tally lights. And these can be set up slightly differently. Um, generally, it's set up so you have a red tally light, so when the camera is live, 
the tally lights light up red, but you can also have um, a green tally light um, if you need to for multi-camera setups. Um, the unit when you buy it comes with a infrared remote control, and this is actually quite easy for some of the setup operations when you're first uh, initiating the camera. But you can turn the camera on and off remotely with the infrared remote. You can also uh, turn the camera on and off from the IP500 or from the web app, and then you can bring it back to life. You can wake it back to life from both the web app and the IP500. But the infrared remote is also handy to have. You get on the on the base of the camera, there is a standard quarter 20 threaded tripod mount. And you can use that to mount the camera on a tripod or if you're hanging the camera from above. But really when you're hanging the camera from above, you probably want to get the ceiling mount bracket, which is a separate item. Um, you, you could hang it from the existing quarter 20, but the ceiling mount bracket makes it much easier because you can slide the camera in and out of the bracket. So you fix the bracket to the ceiling and then the camera can be um, removed and replaced much more easily. Um, and it does also come with lens support rods for when you're using those uh, longer lenses, perhaps if you are using that 70 to 200. Um, I've mentioned this already when we're looking through the menus that you have dual media slots. Um, they're actually on the side of the camera, just on the side here, and your cards go into the side of the camera, and they're CF Express Type A or SDXC cards. Um, to be honest, most of what I do with the FR7, I um, use SD cards. It tends to be what I use in my FX6, and I use V90 class SD cards. And a V90 class SD card, they're relatively low cost. In fact, I bought the last couple that I just bought. I paid um, about, I think it was about £75 um, for a 128 gig card, which gives you around about an hour of 25, 24p record time. So media isn't particularly expensive. Um, if you're using a V90 SD card, then the camera doesn't like to do above 60 frames per second with those cards. Ideally, for anything above 60 frames per second, you want to use the CF Express cards, um, which are much more expensive, but they are also much faster. Um, so that would be the best choice for above 60 frames per second, but it is possible to get away with a V90 SD card um, for 120 frames per second shooting. I don't recommend it. It is not something I am suggesting or recommending that you do but you can do it, um, and most of the time it does work okay. Um, and it's certainly not something Sony would recommend. They, they will also always tell you to use the XD card. Then looking more closely at the back of the unit, you can see that we've got um, a 19.5 volt DC input. I don't know why it's 19.5 volts um, in. It is the same as the FX6. It is the same as the FX9. It's a standard laptop type power supply connector and 19.5 volts is a standard laptop voltage. So you can buy alternative power supplies quite cheaply and quite easily for it. Um, but you can't use 12 volts unless you go through an adapter. Um, for the circus filming, because the camera was mounted up on a truss, I used a DC to DC converter. So I actually had some V-mount batteries um, up in the, on the truss with the camera. And then I had a uh, 15 volt to 20 to a 19 volt converter, DC to DC converter. And that has to deliver about four amps because if you suddenly try and pan or uh, tilt very quickly, <clears throat> it does require a fair bit of power just for that moment as the, as the pan or the tilt starts. So you need a reasonably good quality DC to DC converter to do that. There is an optical output connector. Um, to be honest, I'm not sure what that does. I don't think it does anything at the moment. Perhaps I'm mistaken on that. There is your full-size HDMI output. The audio in is a five-pin XLR. So that gives you two channels of uh, analog input via a five-pin XLR. You have the time code in connector, the option connector, um, a Genlock connector, um, your LAN, um, which allows you to power the camera via PoE++. Um, and then uh, you can obviously stream then via RTSP, SRT, and NDI HX1. Now, the NDI um, 
is an upgrade that you have to purchase from NewTek um, if you want to use that uh, protocol for streaming. Um, looking at the layout of the web app, you can see that, as I've shown you already on the left side, you've got the presets. You then obviously got your monitor, which is where you can use your touch to focus functions, your quick menu at the top right, the main camera info and fast parameter access in the bottom, and then um, your PTZ pad. Now, if I come back to the actual camera controls, you can see here that we this is this sort of main um, control area below the, the, the screen here. And if I select each of these boxes, you'll see that in case of the um, ND here, I can go to manual and now I control can control the ND. So whenever you, let me go back to clear, whenever you touch in one of these boxes, you get the further options um, associated with that pop up below. So if I click on gain here, I see you see I have my gain settings. I could, instead of using 12 dB of gain, in fact, I could go to the high base ISO and then I don't need to use all that gain because the camera is a dual base ISO camera. Um, so it's quite well laid out. Click on shutter speed, I get my shutter speed options. I can change between speed and angle if I want. So it's quite intuitive, quite easy to use. And the first time I used the FR7, I really picked it up very quickly. And it really didn't take me very long to really get to grips with it and to understand um, how it worked and, and, and how it uh, functioned. Up here, where the record settings are, this is where we can bring up the autofocus settings and there we can change the sensitivity and the speed settings very, very quickly. Um, again, shooting the circus, it was very handy to be able to jump in and out of these settings uh, very quickly. You can click on uh, focus hold to hold the focus. Um, we can turn off touch, we can turn off auto and have manual focus. Um, audio settings are here uh, for our four channels of audio. Then we have the streaming modes and we have uh, some other options like uh, bringing this up to a full screen display for, for, for this here. And pan and tilt home, which takes the camera back to its initial point. And there's me le leaning down over the... Um, over the laptop. So it really does give you um, a great deal of control uh, in a very intuitive um, manner. Now, coming down to the pan tilt control down here, um, one of the things here is we can control the, um, the speed of the pan and tilt. Um, and there's also down here, though, this is the camera GUI. So if I press menu, this brings up the camera's menu. So, and this is the same pretty much as the menu that you find in the FX6. And then we can use the up down buttons to um, navigate around this. And we can go into the camera settings, press menu again to remove that. So um, really, <clears throat> And then I can bring up the pan speed if I want. So I want to move the camera much faster from here. I really can go very, very quickly. So um, I've kind of gone through most of the sort of introductions <coughs> of the camera. So if you do have any questions, now is going to be a really good time to, to start uh, entering those questions in the chat box um, and far away with some questions if there's anything else you really need to know about this camera. In the meantime, let me see if I can um, find the circus video for you. Um, it would be quite nice to actually show you that. Um, I'm not sure how um, it's going to appear because I'm playing it off a laptop here um, into the stream. Let me just see what the audio is doing. I can't... Um, actually see what my audio settings are. So let me just um, make sure that the audio is going out on the HDMI. Okay. And let's 
Oh, we don't want that video. And we don't want that one either. So this was shot with the FR7. There were four different performances and the camera was placed in four different positions for the, each performance. The performances are so consistent actually that I was able to cut between them and almost in, in post-production, almost treated like a live production. We got some um, 120 frames per second 4K slow motion there. Um, and the lighting, uh, I had no additional control over the lighting, this was just the lighting that the circus used. So uh, this is where the dual ISO function became really useful, although most of this <coughs> was shot at um, 800 ISO, 800 base. And it was shot with S-Log3 and then graded in post-production, but a, just, a, just a very basic grade really. And just being able to get the camera <coughs> high up with some of these aerial acts was really, really nice. Being able to shoot from above gives you a very different perspective on the performance. And again, this is all um, using mostly autofocus. So this would have been um, using the touch to focus function in particular and then touching on the performer that I wanted the camera to follow. And even in shots like this where the performer is flying through the air on her uh, silk and her ribbon. Um, controlling the camera, following it, was actually reasonably easy. There is a little bit of lag in the image that comes out of the camera, um, maybe one or two frames. But once you get used to that lag, um, actually following even very fast action is quite straightforward and, and quite easy. And I was really pleased with the result that I got and the way that the um, if any pictures look, I felt they looked really good. It's a little bit stuttery in the live stream, it, it is much smoother in, in real life. Um, that's just from coming out of the laptop and then streaming um, uh, live. Um, so that's, um, you know, even, even filming the guy in the big wheel going around there was, was, was quite easy. Um, the fire does look completely smooth in the actual video. It's just uh, coming out of the laptop to stream it isn't um, ideal. So I do actually have a question. Let me just, um, I think I'm finished with all the uh, PowerPoint slides. Um, yeah, so as I've mentioned previously, the FR7 is of course part of the cinema line. So the question that I have is why 5,100 Kelvin? Uh, because I'm indoors, well, I'm indoors and the lighting here is artificial um, and it's daylight balanced. So it's the correct um, color balance or color temperature for what we have in this room. If it um, was anything different to that, um, it would uh, not look right. Um, at the moment, um, the, the white balance settings are being set. Let me just bring up the control panel interface on the PC. So here, my white balance, this was set off a white card. Um, but if I click on, on this, I can just dial in um, any white balance I want. So if I go there and reset, that takes everything back to zero so I can reset the white balance and tint and then if we bring that back up you'll see that 5100 is roughly right or 5500 somewhere in that region is approximately right for for here we can um, white balance off the wall here so if I zoom into the wall it's a nice white wall I could then white balance off this um, there we go, 5.5K is what the camera um, suggests is correct for this room. 
So it does behave pretty much like any other uh, camera in terms of white balance and things like that. Um, and is again, it's it's all very very easy to use. I find the the whole the web interface and everything else very um, very handy to use. Um, so uh, unless really we have any more questions, um, I think I will uh, wrap things up a little bit. A, a couple of things actually before I do on the IP five hundred. So if we look at the IP five hundred here, in terms of the number of cameras you can control, you can have um, up to uh, 10 groups of cameras. So you can have uh, cameras divided up into groups. And then there are, I believe, 10 cameras in each group. So it's 100 cameras could be theoretically controlled from the IP500. Um, I've only myself ever done one at a time. Um, the, as I've mentioned before, we have a zoom rocker here that allows me to zoom in and out. There is a wheel for the focus control. So if you're I'm going to use manual focus. I can go to manual focus. Um, if I bring the FR7 up, I can then use this wheel to control the focus manually. And that allows me then to, to, to have manual control of the focus. Press one button to go back to autofocus. Um, you also have a, another button here that you can use for uh, single push. So again, if I take the image out of focus and then I just hit the button here, it will do a single push um, autofocus. We can select exposure automatically. Currently I've got the, um, I think it's the, um, yes, that's right, the iris on the camera is set to auto. You can see that here, the aperture is set to auto. Um, I could set that to manual um, very easily like that. And then on the IP500, the AE button is going to go off, but we could turn it back on again by pressing the AE button on the IP500 to go back to auto. Um, we can turn the camera on and off from here. We can change the white balance using uh, these four buttons that are up here. Um, on the IP500 very quickly and very easily. And there are assignable buttons that we can assign different functions to. Our controls for the iris, ISO and gain and shutter speed are here. And in terms of setting up the IP500, it's fairly straightforward. Um, it does help if you have a little bit of networking knowledge because you'll need to make sure that both the camera and the uh, IP500 are on the same internet, uh, uh, network uh, subnet. Um, so generally that's a case of connecting the camera to a router. Um, the camera will automatically, it can use um, uh, uh, DNS, uh, not um, brain's gone blank. It will set up the IP address automatically if you wish, or you can manually configure it with a, um, an IP address manually. And then obviously this will have to have corresponding IP address on the same subnet, and then it will search that network for cameras, and it will assign the cameras to the groups within the control panel automatically. Or you can go into the settings and you can uh, manually configure the uh, camera IP addresses and assign specific cameras to specific groups or cameras within each group manually. So it's very easy are very highly configurable. Um, it doesn't take a lot to actually get it configured and to get it programmed. Um, but I say having a little bit of understanding of network addressing and things like that is a big help in subnets. Otherwise, you can end up with these on different subnets or something like that, and then they won't talk to each other. Um, in terms of setting up a tablet or the app to control the camera, again, it's pretty easy. There is actually a um, barcode on the side of the camera. So once the camera, a QR code, so once the camera is connected to your network, um, all you need to do is to scan the QR code on the side of the camera, and that will put the uh, web address of the camera in terms of a local um, lookup web address into your web browser, and then you'll be able to log into the camera. So to control the camera, you have to log in. There is a default 
passwords set on every camera. Um, or if, if you've forgotten that or can't use that, need to change that, you can reset the camera and put your own password and username in. Um, and then each device that connects to the camera has to have that username and password. So that does stop people randomly going onto your network and just logging into the camera and taking over control of it. So it is all password protected. And if your network is connected to the World Wide Web, it is possible to actually control the camera from anywhere in the world. If you know the IP address of the camera, you can log into that network from anywhere in the world and control the camera remotely. Um, and that has lots of potential applications for corporate videos where you might need to control the camera that might be in a boardroom somewhere else in the country or in another, in another country, um, as well as for natural history and things like that, where perhaps you're using a camera like this to watch uh, a bird's nest or something like that, and you can log in remotely. You'll get the preview image from pretty much anywhere. Although obviously the further you are from the camera and the more complex the network routing between your control device and the camera, the more delay and latency there will be and that's something you can't really completely avoid. So um, that is Sony's FR7. I really do think it is a great piece of kit. I think it will find all sorts of applications where perhaps traditionally you wouldn't use a PTZ camera. Um, and so, some ideas of that actually is things like, as, as myself, I often do interviews and things like that as a single shooter. And potentially you could have your main camera that you operate yourself. You could have your tablet mounted on your tripod just below your main camera. And you could have an FR7 doing that second camera angle. And you can very quickly then change the framing. You can check that it's recording. You can do everything with the camera from your main operating position. You haven't actually got to leave that operating position to reframe the camera if your talent or the person you're interviewing moves or you just simply want to do a different shot. So I think there are lots of applications there for single shooters wanting a second camera to, to shoot alternative stops, uh, shots. I think for corporate video, you could have a bunch of FR7s all remotely controlled from one place along with a very uh, with a vision mix, a vision, vision switcher, um, which cuts down on the number of crews that you perhaps need. I, I know I, I, I would love us all to be working and be very busy, um, and that's perhaps doing away with crews, but you still need somebody that's going to operate those FR7s. So perhaps somebody that would perhaps previously have been standing by the camera operating it is now going to be behind the scenes operating it remotely. So it's not always um, means a, 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 lock, a loss of jobs. It perhaps just means a change of jobs and a change of what you do. Um, but the big one for me that I see with it is, is getting the camera into positions and locations that you can't normally get a camera operator, such as up in the rigging of a big top circus tent, um, right at the front of the stage for live performances where a camera operator would be in the way. Um, and all of those sorts of things. And it's not a quality Im uh, compromise. You are not giving up anything in terms of image quality, which is normally the case with PTZ cameras. Um, and that ability to change lenses. You could put your favorite cinema glass on this camera. It's a Sony E-mount. It's Sony's uh, normal E-mount, the same as you have on the FX6, F, F X3, FX30, all of the cinema line cameras and all of the alpha cameras. And that means then you have a huge range of lenses that you can choose from. You could put a PL adapter on it if you want to use a PL mount lens. The camera itself does actually um, sit on a, a plate that slides forwards and backwards. So when you first put your lens on it, you'll move it forwards and backwards to, to balance it, to get the best bounce. Um, but it can take a fair bit of weight. I'm not sure that Sony have actually published a weight limit, but you can certainly put Sony 70 to 200 on there with the Crozial Zoom Kit, and that's quite heavy. Um, and it still works fine with that. And I think you can go a little bit longer with focal lengths with some other lenses as well. Um, but there are weight limits ultimately in the end. Um, so I recommend it to you if you need a remote camera 
especially if you need that image quality to match the rest of the cinema line. It's a very close match even with the Sony Venice cameras. Um, I can see these being used in features um, just to get a camera somewhere uh, that allows you to shoot with the main camera and perhaps this is hidden in the set somewhere to get a second shot or just in that really difficult and hard to get uh, location to get very unique and specific shots. So a quick check to see if we've got any more questions. Um, I don't see any more questions. So I'll wait a few moments, type away with those questions in the chat box um, before I um, wrap up this session. The session uh, is being recorded, so you will be able to watch it again later, uh, should you wish. And we do actually have another session next week. So next week I'm doing a session um, which is a much broader look at the Sony Cinema line. And that session is really aimed at producers, um, directors, PAs, people like that, that want to understand which camera to use for which application, what to use when and where, uh, what the cinema line is all about, uh, and how those different cameras may be suited for different jobs and things like that, and, and why you would choose one over the other. So that's next week's session. So let's just see if any questions have come in. No, they haven't. So I hope you found this useful. Um, if you still have any questions, do um, email them to visuals and they'll forward them on to me. And don't forget, do um, build up that relationship with a dealer. It's a really good relationship to have because if you buy your equipment, um, often actually, then this was something I was told the other day, is actually very often you go online, you get a price on a website and you can search between different websites and you will assume that that's the best price that you can get. But very often, actually, if you actually talk to somebody, you know, pick up that old fashioned thing called a telephone and you talk to someone face to face and in person, they might even be able to do an even better deal for you. Not always, but they might be. Um, or they might be able to put a bundle of things together if you want to buy a camera with a lens, with some other accessories, you might find you can actually get a better price by picking up the phone and talking to them and chatting with them. They're really nice people here at VI. They're quite friendly, they don't bite. So um, next time you're making a purchase decision, do pick up the phone and have a chat with them, build up that relationship. And then when things, you may, maybe something in the deal doesn't work out, you need to change the lens or something like that. It's gonna be much easier because you'll know who to talk to and who to speak to. So that's it from me, Alistair Chapman. Um, if you need to know more about the cinema line in general, join me next week for next week's session. Otherwise, have a good week, and I'll catch up with you again sometime in the future, I hope. Thank you very much.